So welcome. I'm glad you're all here. My name is Karen Tome, and I have managed the social media for the diocese for about the past five years or so. And I'm local. I'm here in Orlando. Um, no problem. I'm here in Orlando. I live in on the west side of town. So, oh, good. I think she's back. Yay, Wendy. There we go. I'll pass it back to you, Wendy, as soon as you can. Okay. There. <laughs> I'm back. So that's what you do when your computer dies on you all of a sudden. I'm not sure what happened. Sorry about that. We are recording. Did you already press that, Karen? I did. I pressed recording. Did you get started or would you like me to start? I'd like you to start because now screen sharing has stopped. So <laughs> I've got to get that <laughs> going. Do I need to do anything for that? Um, now that I've um, probably log logged back in. Yes, it says it's disabled. So I just allowed participants to share screen. Are you? Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right. Sorry for that little glitch there, but you guys are all probably a little bit familiar with glitches now that everybody is doing some kind of digital communication that we haven't done in the past. We are recording. If Karen hasn't mentioned it already, the video and the audio is recording and we will have this available on our YouTube channel. I'll send you guys a link out first, but then it's, it'll be available to anybody on the YouTube channel. And Karen has a lot of information for us. It's going to be kind of a fire hose of information. So she's gonna stop every once in a while and give you guys an opportunity to ask questions. You can post your questions in the chat and I will let her know what you've asked or when she takes a break, just stick your hand up in front of your camera and she'll call on you. And this can be interactive. Part of the point of this meeting is to get people comfortable interacting with your audience and screens may seem a little bit intimidating but push through that and interact and you know that's what this class is all about i want to give you a little bit of information about karen she's been working as the social media content manager for the diocese of central florida for five years her background is digital marketing she's been in the faith-based area of digital marketing for over 15 years. She has experience with easily over 50 clients and one of her clients was Campus Crusade for Christ, which is now called Crew. And she is very in touch with the message and the values of the diocese and she'll share with you later how important it is to know what your unique values are. She has a visual presentation for us. Again, she'll take some time at a couple of breaks in her presentation so that you can ask questions. So jot them down or put them in the chat. And I'm gonna turn this over to her. Fasten your seatbelts, get ready. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Wendy. Well, let's um, go ahead and dive in. I'm excited. I love um, one of the benefits of COVID is that even though I've been, you know, in many ways working with the various churches these past five years, it hasn't been until COVID that I actually get to really meet people um, and see faces. And so um, I'm definitely counting that as something to be grateful for when there are many things that we find frustrating. That's definitely a, a benefit that I found that I'm glad um, it can help build relationships moving forward. So let's just dive right in into this social media um, training. Okay, 
my view is that most of us consider social media a little bit like how we were in you know middle school or high school and you just desperately want people to like you so you're standing there and you've got your page and you're you're making posts and you're wondering oh my goodness if people aren't commenting if they're not liking it they must not like me they must not like my church they must not there's something about me that they're not liking and we very much take it personally well what i'm hoping to show you is that social media is very much about what is put out and less about the actual individual um, especially when it comes to organizations and brands we're responding to their content we're not as much responding to them individually so for all my hamilton fans out there king george isn't king content is king so the beauty of having content being king is that that can change so if you're finding that it's just not resonating you're creating all of this work and you're it's like crickets out there and no one's responding it doesn't mean that they don't like you it means there's something that you're putting out that isn't hitting them it's not hitting them in a way that's enticing a response so that's all about the content um, it's about the content it's about the delivery but it's very much content not you as a person or you as a church so the you know million dollar question right the question that we're all here for is okay so what type of content is actually engaging what's going to get the responses that we're looking for what's going to get the action so that's the your you know the number one question so engaging content provides value now i did not coin this phrase i heard this years ago um, for marketing purposes and it has stuck with me forever um, and it's the idea of in your mind think wifm radio like everything you put out put out have in your mind wifm radio what's in it for me and that is what content that's the content that matters to the people because ultimately every, we're all ultimately somewhat selfish people right we want to know hey does this help me does this encourage me does this make me laugh does this give me information all of those things inspire responses because i'm getting something from it otherwise you just kind of scroll right by and you don't you don't like it you don't share it you don't comment on it you don't do anything on it because it didn't give you anything does that make sense so i guess it's you know weird to ask does that make sense and then everyone's on mute <laughs> but if it doesn't make sense or whatever uh raise your hand drop in the chat um something like that but that this is kind of what i want you to have in your mind wifm radio what's in it for me so the question then becomes what is value right so the value can't just be oh my gosh people love this so let's give them that it needs to tie to your church's value your core values the core mission that you have and you know in the faith-based world in the church world we all kind of say we have lots of values right like oh a value is evangelism a value is social justice a value is anti-racism a value is giving to um, your community. Those are all incredible values. But think through in your particular church, in your particular expression of faith, what typically comes out? Like what, how do you typically live out your faith values? That's the type of content you should be creating because those are the type of people who are gonna be attracted to your church and to and so there'll be a it'll mesh because if you're constantly posting about evangelism and then you go in and those are never your sermon topics there's going to be a disconnect and people are going to say how come like that doesn't that doesn't match 
But if you are posting about um, community service and feeding people and having a food pantry, and then you actually have pictures that you can share of you doing that in the community, that's going to align. And then the people who are interested in that are going to like that and share, and it will attract other people who care about giving food. So does that make sense? You really want to have your content align with your core values as an organization, as a church. So my experience is that there's pretty much five buckets that faith-based organizations have content. Like this is the type of content for faith-based organizations. And I have them in order based on what typically is most engaging. So you've got photos and videos are going to be your number one. Quotes, which we don't talk about. Some of those quotes are, you know, can be sermon quotes. They can be quotes from, um, you'll see on our social media, I usually do a quote from um, the, the Sunday, the collect for the week. That's a quote. Um, Bible verses are quotes. So messages like that, those perform well. Church information, sermons and blogs, and then curated content. Um, curated content is any content that you did not create. It does not come from your church, but it's representative of some of a value that you have. So it could be sharing content from the Episcopal church, the broader church, sharing content from presiding bishop, Curry. It could be sharing content from a church that you partner with in the community. Um, or if you focus on homelessness in your church, it could be sharing content from the Coalition for Homelessness or you know that kind of idea. That's curated content, content that you're sharing that you did not create, but it aligns with your core values. So, let me pause there and ask, do you have questions? Is this aligning with what you're expecting to hear? Good? Okay. So now we're gonna go into um, the six phases of content management. And that's basically, we'll go through each phase one by one. And what I wanna show you is my process of how I do it and how I feel like it can be transferable in any phase, you know, in any, if you're, if you're starting with social media, if you've been doing this for, you know, 10 years, this is a process that you can follow. So the first phase of, oh my goodness, there, the very first phase is called the content audit. Content audit just means, hey, what do I have? So for the content audit, you go back to the content buckets and you say, what do I have? Do I have photos? Do we have videos? Like, you know, how many people have a Dropbox or an old hard drive of photos that you've never thought about? Cause you're just, you know, like, oh, someone needs to take a picture today, but you forget you've been doing this for a long time. You might have historical photos, like, do you have photos? Do you have videos? Those perform well, so identify them. Quotes. Do you have any, like, you know, is it, are you, do you want to post something like every Sunday about the collect for the week? Are there Bible verses? Is there a theme verse that you have? Like those can be quotes. Church information, you probably have that. That's probably housed with your church administrator has all of that sermons, blogs, probably now you're recording your sermons. That's fantastic. Blogs would be, you know, perhaps your um, priest is blogging or writing articles. Um, Bishop Brewer has a blog, so you can definitely count that into your content bucket. Um, and then curated content would be identify those sources that align with your values. So in your community, do you want to do you want to be sharing local community news? Do you want to know the um, affiliates around you? Identify what those are. That's your content audit. And it goes like 
right in line with the content library. And that's basically once you've identified what you have, now make a list of where it is. So this is a template that I'm going to give you after this call. Um, you can all make it your own, but I've already set in the five buckets and I'm just gonna show you how I use this template. So for example, under photos and videos, okay, I know we have lots of videos, they're on YouTube. So I put the name of the source is YouTube. And then in the link, I would put a link to our diocesan YouTube channel. You could put a link there to the, the diocesan channel. You could also have a line for YouTube if you have your own channel. You can add a line for YouTube that's like um, Bishop Curry's channel. It's basically get yourself a spreadsheet of identifying the big buckets of content that you have so it's easily accessible. And then I have a field for, you know, if you want to make any notes about it. It's really just a spreadsheet with a links or info. And the idea for this is that A, it's going to continue to grow, but B, it's something that you can hand off to someone else. So social media doesn't always have to land completely on your desk. Once you, you know, gathered, this is the type of content we want to share, and this is where we really want to pull it from. Um, those give you some guidelines and the rest of the process will really give you guidelines for how to pass it off to someone else. So now we've audited, we've identified what we need. We are creating a library, which is basically the spreadsheet of, you know, where all of this content lives. Now we need to make a content calendar because the calendar is basically going to say, when does it make the most sense to share this particular content? So I'm going to give you this template too. This is another one. Um, so I have a Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. You can adapt if you're only on Facebook, just delete the other fields. So, the idea here is that under, it's divided by day. So this is a weekly template, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, it goes all the way down. The type of post is which content bucket is it? Is it a curated content? Is it an article? Is it a video? Is it a quote? And the idea there is so that you'll be sharing different types of content. So you're not always show it, showing videos and posts or videos and photos you're diversifying your content and the best way to do that is to you know have a spreadsheet to say oh my goodness i've shared three photos this week let me let me switch it up so you have the type of the post then you know if you're doing a theme you can write the theme there you don't have to then the actual copy of what you want to say the field for that a link to anything that you want to um, post about it and then the time of day to post and then I have a little checkbox like is this scheduled so this is another thing that it can be done by multiple people different people can be filling this out for the week you could be authoring it and then handing it off to someone else to schedule you can work in um, in tandem it's a way to manage your social media in a way that doesn't make the burden fall directly on one person. Now, this image to the right shows you how I do it now. Like, so this is, this is live. Um, I mean, it's a picture, but this is like <laughs> from, this is how I manage the social media. I use Basecamp. Do any of you use Basecamp in your churches or a project management tool? You don't have to use that one. It's just what I use. So what I like about it is that um, I assign a date, it notifies me, like, you know, it's got the built-in notification. So I assign things to myself. But what I do is whatever is coming up, I'm creating a little task. So there was a deacon ordination on the 12th from 11 to 1230. Like it just helped me know it. It's going to alert me. It's going to pop up on my phone um, at that time. So I'm like, so I know, hey, 
around 1230, I need to be checking to see if anyone's posted a photo that I can reshare. So it's, it's a great way for me to do things that are in the moment. Um, but then I'd like to draw your attention down to 2021 events. So things that are happening, you know, every year that you just don't want to forget, that's part of the content calendar. So I have on there Bishop Brewer's birthday. That's something that's not going to show up on a regular calendar, but it's like, oh, that's something that's relevant to the diocesan social media that people would care about. So I'm going to put that on the calendar so I remember. The Pulse anniversary in Orlando, that's a major event. So it would be, you know, it would be very odd for the diocese to miss that since it's located, like the headquarters are located like around the corner from where the Pulse um, tragedy happened. So it's things like that that you want to pay attention, not just to giant calendar events, not just to the liturgical calendar, but what are the events that are local in your community that you would also want to pay attention to that probably wouldn't show up when, you know, when you're looking at your regular calendar and planning out. You want to have both of those um, working together. So, um, okay, questions. What value do Twitter and LinkedIn give you? Great question. I'll address that at the end. Is Basecamp a calendar or a reminder system or something else? Basecamp is a project management system. Um, so if you're not using it, don't. <laughs> like it's, it's basically a project management tool. If your church uses it, oh, thank you. If your whole church uses it, like your um, administrative staff, it's fantastic. If you're just using it, um, no, I say that and I just use it, but I'm managing, I, I like project management systems. So it works perfectly for me. Um, it works best when you have like your whole staff is on it. Do you have a question, Laverne? Yes, mm -hmm. I am not sure that I'm clear on the, the uh, process of the bucket and developing the spreadsheet. Do you do this for um, each particular topic or, you know, I, I'm not sure that I understand how you would do this. For instance, when you take an ordination, Mm -hmm. Do you do ordinations and work that through and then come back, let's say, and do another generic topic or That what? is a great, great question. So ordinations is a wonderful example. I know that ordinations are going to have a lot of photos. So for the week of the ordination, you know, the, the day of and a day or two later, that's going to be photo heavy. So in terms of my content calendar planning, I'm not going to find other photos. I'm not going to schedule other photos because they're going to be competing with the ordination photos. So what then I would do is I would probably schedule an article that's not going to compete with these photos, which I don't want to draw attention away from because people are really going to care about those. Does that make sense? So you don't have to, I, I look at it in terms of a week, pretty much in the course of a week, what am I sharing? And then overall in the course of the month, what am I sharing? But really I'm looking at a week. I don't wanna do like three quotes in a week. I'll do one, maybe two. And then so that's it for quotes. What is your recommendation then on how often we should be posting to social media? So that's an excellent, um, great question. So my recommendation for how often um, is going to depend on what platform you have. But I would say, you know, if you're starting out, go for three times a week. That's it. Like it can be that, is that a lot or is that a little? <laughs> Oh, that's much more than we've been posting. Right okay. There. <laughs> okay. So I thought we were doing pretty good, obviously. Okay. <laughs> <We've got laughs> a lot more. 
<laughs> well, and so, you know, what it comes down to is going to be what content do you have? So look at your content and then see how, do I have a lot of content? Well, then I can up my posting. But if you don't have very much, you don't want to put out the same thing or bad stuff just to meet your, you know, three times a week goal. So that's why I say content is king. You have to look at what do you have and then whatever you have, let that be, you know, let that be the guide and then build from there. So, um, Let's get to creation and these are great questions and then we'll tackle some more of the questions and go deeper if we haven't, if I haven't answered them well. So, okay, creation. I'm starting with the style guide and that might seem overwhelming for, for you guys, but let's just, you know, do a quick poll. Do you, how many of you, know that your church has a style guide. You have one, great. Um, I actually can't see everybody, but so the style guide is really, really, really important because it basically gives the framework, it gives the guidelines and it makes doing social media so much easier. So, but it's not just about, you know, the ease of the person who's creating it, it's about the brand and having the consistency and the experience for the people who are reacting to your um, information. They start to learn what to expect. They start to learn, oh, these are these, if I see this particular color, I know it's coming from this church. So it's really building the consistency um, with, your, with your audience. And the same, that same answer goes towards how often to post, like build a consistency. So, you know, maybe it's, I post every Sunday and it's once a week, but people know every single Sunday I'm going to post that's, that's better than posting sporadically, like building consistency goes a long way. So my recommendation for what you should have in your style guide is, um, if your church has a logo, which it probably does, your logo. Do you have access to it? What size should it be? That's important to know for um, not so much Facebook, but if you're on Instagram, um, you need guidelines for what size that logo should be and where it should go. Should it always be in the right-hand corner? Should it be at the left? Should it ever, like, are there rules? Doesn't matter what the rules are, but you need them <laughs> and you need to be consistent with them. Colors, um, find out what your colors are and ideally you would have primary and secondary colors. You would cover, um, so you would know, hey, we really only use this particular red when we're wanting to talk about X, Y, or Z. So it's like, you know, identify your primary and secondary and you need them in, um, if you don't get them in any other way, hex. Hex is that, it's a little hashtag and then six digits. Um, it's usually numbers and letters combined. That turns into a color <laughs> for the web. So if you have those six from your graphic designer or, um, or someone who, who knows how to get that for you, get that and then apply it into any of your content creation. Typography is, you know, the fancy word for what fonts do you use? Um, do you have different fonts for heading? Do you have different fonts for body size? That's not going to matter for Facebook, but it's going to matter for any imagery you create. So if you're creating images for, so for Instagram, or if you're creating images to share on Facebook, you want to have that correct. Um, then we get to imagery. And so that's like the stock photos that you're buying. If you're buying them, there's also free ones. But if you're using any stock photography, um, what type of stock photography do you use? So do you have like, we only wanna show stock photography that is diverse. That could be like, you know, a guideline that you wanna have. Like if it's not a, if it doesn't show diversity, we don't wanna have it. Or if it doesn't show, like it could be gender diversity, it could be age diversity, 
anything. Um, if it doesn't have that, we don't want it. Or if it doesn't have people smiling and happy, we don't want it. Or if it doesn't have, um, we really don't want stock imagery of people, but we, um, if we're gonna use stock imagery, we want it to always have a church and we want it to always have a stained glass. So these are the kinds of things that if you have that kind of in your guidelines, it really helps um, create a consistent look and feel. So again, it doesn't matter what you choose. It matters more that you have a decision made. And then attribution, um, a lot are, you don't have to give attribution, but some you do. So you need to make sure that if you, whatever um, image you're sharing on social media, that you have the proper licensing to share it. Um, so that's just an aside. The image itself will tell you the license. It's not a big deal if you're sharing, you know, your own personal photos, but especially if you're showing photos of children, you know, like kids at church or whatever, you want to make sure that you have permission to do that. Um, so that's the imagery. And then finally, voice is, are you formal on social media? Are you like, how, what is your formality? What type of brand voice does your church have? Are you going to use abbreviations? Um, and if so, how? So there's just, there's just a number of, it's kind of good to have that written so that people, so that the, even that stays consistent. Um, and that's just, you know, style guide. And again, that's a one and done. Like once it's created, you don't really have to think about it again. You can look at it annually and say, Hey, does this still reflect who we are and who we want to be? But it's a, it's a one and done thing. It's not something you have to think about all the time. Um, in terms of creation, I use Canva. Um, Canva is free. And there is also a paid version that you can do. You can do the free one. Um, I do the paid version just because it makes my life simpler and it's $12 a month. So it's not gonna like kill you. Um, and what I like about the paid version is that I can upload fonts and brand colors and all of that. And so it just takes away the having to do things manually each time. But that's how I create, um, these I post these every single Sunday and I would put this under the quote category. So this is in the in the Facebook post and in the Instagram comment, I put the full collect for the week. But then for the quote, I really shorten it because it's too much to digest if you put in all the words. Like you need things that are easy to see, easy to, you know, like they see it. They can read it and then they can swipe like share away. Um, but it's just, it's hard to, you know, when you're on your phone and scrolling, it's very hard to read an entire collect. But if you see this and you like it, then you read the comment. So you're still getting it. Um, it's just, how are you displaying it? And then you'll also see that I'm, you know, brand consistent. So there's the gold that people are comfortable seeing, like they're familiar seeing and, um, and I create all of these um, a month at a time. So I basically get onto Canva, create all of September's at once, then it's done. And so you're not thinking about it again. If you only share one thing a week, it could be a quote <laughs> and you can create them all in a batch and then it's done. So these are, um, hopefully it's an idea for you for how to like streamline. So I know that we are ultimately caring about what's valuable, right? So here's an idea of 10 different topics that you could have. And so these are post ideas that you would align with your content bucket. So I'm gonna go kind of one by one so that hopefully you can see what I mean. So behind the scenes, people love behind the scenes. That can be, that would be a photo or a video. Take a picture, show, you know, take a picture of like how you're doing Zoom this week or how, whatever it is. Take a picture, talk about it, 
and in the caption or in the Facebook post. And that's a behind the scenes. That's your photo for the week or, you know, however many you're doing or your video, ask a question. Okay. So that's just a good old fashioned engaging topic. I would make the question align with something in your content calendar. So if it's um, an upcoming holiday, uh, what's your favorite, you know, meal at Thanksgiving? What's your favorite side dish? Like that can be just a very simple way to align with the content calendar. And it's a simple question. As people get comfortable answering the question, then they'll be more likely you can ask questions that more align with your core values. So after that week's sermon, you can ask a probing question, um, like what did this you know, mean to you? Or how can I pray for you this week? Or who, you know, I've done tag a nurse or a frontline worker during COVID that we can pray for. Those are all ways to just, it's very simple, ask a question, but it, it inspires people to comment. Um, share your church history. That's another one people love. Like we don't often think about it, but that would be a photo that could be like, it would, it would best be aligned with a photo. And then um, something you will, you know, write a little comment about it. But I would do that on Thursday or Friday. And so that hashtag throwback Thursday, that's a very common hashtag. People follow that. And so it's going to open it up and other people are going to hear. Flashback Friday is another one. Um, spotlight a, a volunteer, you know, I would put that one more into like the article category. So you take a picture of someone who's volunteering and then do like a little interview with them, write a cup, write a paragraph or two and post that on your website. And so then it's, it becomes an article that you're linking to and it's spotlight a volunteer, you know, inspire people to volunteer with you for your next event. Explain a church term. I mean, that's something that's, you know, going to engage some of these, like, I don't have to go deep. Um, host an IG takeover that may be new to you. Um, that would be relevant. Like, I'd love to do that if for the diocese, for the diocese. So let me know if you're interested where we highlight a church. So like basically for a solid day, the, a local church, um, or a local, you know, community that you're partnering with, um, a community organization you're partnering with, they manage your Instagram and it's basically, they are, it's video based. So they're sharing what they're doing through the course of that day or whatever. And it's, their followers are going to respond. It's just, it's a win for both sides. It's also just fun. Poll, invite people to your service. Those are all engaging post ideas. So we're getting close. You guys are doing great. Then we move on to publishing. So we've created the content, now we need to publish it. So you can use publishing tools like Buffer and Hootsuite. There are others. I personally use Buffer. And the 100% free version is if you do Facebook Pages Manager, you can schedule posts directly from within the pages manager of Facebook. So if you're using Facebook, um, the, it's, it's the simplest way to go. It's what I would recommend for Facebook. Don't pay anything and just use um, pages manager. So you go in there, you click create a post, you make it, and then it'll say, do you want to publish now or do you want to schedule it into the future? So you just click the date and time you want to schedule and it would show up as a list. So, uh, um, so you decided, okay, I'm going to schedule it to the future, but when? Now, Facebook also basically tells you exactly when your people are online. This is all in the um, Facebook manager. A big thing to note, and I've circled it, is that all of this is in Pacific time. So you need to remember to convert it to Eastern because otherwise you'll be posting things three hours differently. 
<laughs> then, when, then when's the best time? Now, pretty much this graph, I would say, tells us absolutely nothing of value because everybody's on like during the daylight hours. This is called the COVID graph. This graph did not look like this before COVID at all. So if you're starting social media now, like it's a great time because pretty much you can put thing that, things out anytime you want because we are all stuck in a house on our devices. <laughs> so it's a, it's a fine time. Pre-COVID, you know, there were definitely dips. It corresponded with your, with your work day. So like people would get up in the morning, they would check, and then they'd be getting ready for work and nothing's happening. Then before lunch, you would see a spike. Then on the drive home, you would see a spike. Then nothing during dinner and like school activities and all of this. And then around nine o'clock at night, people are winding down. So you definitely, it definitely looked more like an interesting graph. Right now, pretty much anytime you want. And any day of the week is the same. Pre-COVID, the days of the weeks really mattered. Now, not so much. So shows you about um, looking at analytics. So finally, we've scheduled it, we made it, we've scheduled it, so then promote it. And so promoting pretty much means how do we get, how do we really maximize the fact that this can get in front of people? So the best way to do that is tag people. So if you're posting photos, tag them. It's hard to do that as a page, um, but as an individual, if they're your friends, you can go in and tag them. So then that way it gets exposure. You can tag pages very easily. Easily, The location feature is big. Um, you can do this both on Facebook and Instagram. Um, it's really great for Instagram. So pretty much you might see, if I'm sharing content from your church, I will always tag your church as the location of where I've posted it. And it helps you so then people who are like searching um you know instagram and facebook are going to send you or instagram in particular is going to send you information that you might be interested in that's around you so if i'm posting about your church um it's going to show up to them because i've tagged your location hashtags um there's in instagram you can in particular you can in the search bar type a hashtag, like hashtag, you know, COVID, let's say, do hashtag COVID, it'll show up results of a bunch of different hashtags that are associated with that one. So you can pick um, good hashtags. Now, you might want to pick like the one with, you know, a million um, people in it. And sometimes that's nice just to like join the crowd. But if you want to stand out, you actually want to pick a hashtag with lower people and that gives you a chance to like join in. So do like hashtag COVID, but there might be hashtag um, COVID. I think um, one of the churches here did um, grace in a time of Corona. So it's like you might be doing hashtag COVID-19, but then you've had your own that you've made. And then it's like hashtag um, Ocala, hashtag churches in Ocala. So it's like, those are kind of ways that you do the big buckets and then you narrow down to more specific ones. And that's how you can show up um, with some of these popular hashtags. Boosted posts, um, this is a paid thing, um, but I recommend it. In Facebook, if you see a post that's doing well or semi well or you think like no this is actually really important i'd love to get it out you can click you know just boost this post it's paid advertising and it can be as low as like two dollars a day and it you know and you would you would choose the audience it could be you know what i actually want, really want my own people to know this so if it's really important for your church to know it you may want to boost it to all the people who follow your page, or you may want to expand it to people who follow your page and live in this zip code or people, you know, Facebook advertising lets you get super duper duper specific. 
and the most effective work is going to be the more if you've made your audience specific. So boosted post is a great way to do that. And the, the dollar amount, um, I really, I think the dollar amount is $2 a day. That's the lowest. It might be a dollar, but um, I typically stick with $2 a day. Um, reply to comments. Obviously, that's a way to um, share, to boost engagement. And then share your post to stories. So the same post that you made on Instagram or on Facebook, then share it to the story. So a lot of people are, you know, going through their stories day by day, and then they'll see it that way. It's just another way to share the content without having to recreate new content. So how was that for a fire hose? Um, I'm going to stop talking now and then open up. We can open up the chat. We have a lot of questions. Yes. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Let me, let me start with those. Yep. Um, and I'm going to go backwards. So the most recent question first, um, we just received a question. What is the significance of having a story? Mm. So maybe um, explaining even sure. what a story is. A story is, it can be video or it can be, um, you know, a post of a picture or it can be text. Um, so I will say that my experience with stories is primarily Instagram over Facebook. Um, but I usually do, I usually live in Instagram and then push it to Facebook stories. But the significance is that people think it's fun. Um, so it d really depends on your audience and the diocesan audience doesn't use it very often. So it may not be used a lot with your church, um, but people like it. Um, and I will say that they will watch the sermons when I post sermons to the stories so you can actually share like um bishop brewers like full or your own um you create your video you upload your video like to youtube or whatever but once you have that mp4 file the actual file from instagram if you're using um the pages if you're using like the business version or whatever of instagram there is a little button called IGTV. You click that and you can upload your video. Um, all that can be done from your, from your computer. So people watch it and like it. I don't know if that really answered the question. It's just fun. So we have another question. Um, which of the social media platforms are best and are some of them age appropriate and some not so um best really depends on what type of content you have if you have a lot of um images like beautiful beautiful images instagram is really great for that um, it really it specializes on you know pictures if you have lots of articles you want to share, Instagram is a pain in the butt for that because I, you, you can't share articles easily at all. So then you've got Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn for that. Um, my recommendation and by and large, our greatest impact is Facebook, like Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. It depends on your audience. So if you, um, work with youth, they're not really going to be on Facebook. So they're probably going to be over on Instagram and Snapchat and, you know, all the other quick high engagement place. And they're really going to care about video and chatting and that. So it depends on your audience and it depends on your content. Let's see. Okay, so earlier you spoke about Facebook pages manager. Mm -hmm. Does that allow you to post on Instagram as well? You have to connect the accounts. So yes, um, they are owned by the same company. And so they're friends. Um, but you have to 
from Instagram, you have to connect your account to Facebook and Facebook has to like connect it back to Instagram. And I will say that I have nothing but trouble with that, but it, it does work sometimes. <laughs> How much content is too much before it becomes spam? Mm. Um, it look at your numbers and see how people are responding. If people are engaging with it and you, you're not seeing your, you're seeing the, you know, graph line go up in terms of engagement and Facebook analytics will tell you, so will Instagram, they will tell you if people are unfollowing you and when they unfollowed, what type of, what, what post they actually clicked unfollow on. You want to look at that. So it's not spam if people are responding to it. It is spam if it's like you're putting it out there and it's crickets. They're telling you we're not interested. So you need to look at, look at the analytics and see how people are responding and then, um, and then gauge based on that. So at the beginning, you mentioned that it really doesn't matter if people are liking your content because content is king, but if they're not liking it, then Facebook isn't boosting and getting your content in front of people. So how does that work in order to get your content in front of people without a whole lot of likes? Okay. Um, I did not communicate clearly. So if people aren't liking, I was meaning if people aren't liking your things, it doesn't mean they don't like you it means their content that you're putting out isn't resonating. So 100%, you need to put content out that people like, comment on, and share. Um, that is how you get engagement. And when you don't, Facebook penalizes you. So let's make that loud and clear. If you put out content that's just you know, to crickets, you put something out and nobody does anything, Facebook's going to say, Hey, I don't know who these people are, but nobody cares. So they only show you, they only show your content to a percentage, a small percentage of your followers. If you're showing content and no one's responding, that number is going to keep going down and it's already small. So you want to put content out that people respond to. So that's why it's better to put it out once a week, good content, than seven days a week, bad content. And real quick, um, before Brian has to jump off, um, what is a good time to post things? How do you know mm -hmm. when a good time is? So, the analytics are going to tell you, like I was saying right now, pretty much any time is fine. Um, typically, typically, typically the evening hours is a great time for like pictures because people are just scrolling. It's not so much a great time for an article that you want them to read. Just think about your own life. Like just think about, do I want to read this article at nine o'clock? No. Would I love to look at some photos? Yes. Post those then. <laughs> Save your articles to like when people have had their coffee. <laughs> um, those are, it's great to have, you know, morning, um, noon, sometimes like the um, lunch, you know, when the after lunch crash, you'll get on and then you'll read. Daytime hours are a good time for that. Weekend isn't always great because people don't want to read that on the weekend either. Now, what about Twitter and LinkedIn? What value do you give those for our audience? So that, um, that's another great question. Those are valuable um, in their own right. So Twitter is a great place. Bishop Brewer loves Twitter. Twitter is a great place if you want to engage um, over really articles and ideas and current events. Like if, if something is happening right now, people flock to Twitter. Um, so we pretty much use it for info um, and articles or things maybe we would want the news media to pick up. Twitter's good for that because they're all monitoring Twitter. 
But if it's like an announcement that I want people to hear about, I don't put it on Twitter. I put it on Facebook. Um, and then I'll share it into a Facebook group so that I can make sure it gets put in front of the right amount of people. LinkedIn, the specialty of LinkedIn is really, um, I would say if you're trying to recruit or draw people to work at your church, um, LinkedIn is great. It's, um, it's, one, it's where people go when they're looking for a job. It's where people go when they need to hire um, a role. And so it helps solidify your church and connections that way. So it's more of, I wouldn't think of it as much as like a community building for the parishioners of your church, but it's excellent for um, more of like church administration. And um, you were mentioning the scheduling um, apps that you can use, mm -hmm. Hootsuite, mm -hmm. um, and there's others out there. Do you have a recommendation for which one is the best to integrate social media this particular church uses ig or uh, instagram facebook twitter and youtube fabulous um i use buffer i recommend buffer um it is it integrates with all of those channels with the exception of instagram because instagram is annoying in that way um what it does you'll create your posts you'll create your comments you'll do or your um comment about the picture and in Instagram. And then when it's time to post, it's going to send a notification to your phone. So you have to post from your phone. Um, so that's the only drawback. It's not a big drawback, but that's the only one. Otherwise, you know, I recommend Buffer wholeheartedly. I've used Hootsuite, but I just don't like it. And one of these questions is maybe outside of the realm of what we're talking about today, but this person works for the Curcio Commission, um, volunteers on the Curcio Commission, and there's a website on the diocesan website, there's a Facebook page, and there's a Yahoo outlet, and they have a large database, but they're not able to send messages or information to them, so what's the best site to use? I want to jump so, in and ask a question. Um, Charles, are you still on? Yes. Okay. Um, Charles Pierce, um, if you want to unmute your. I'm screen. unmuted. So, um, why are you unable to send messages? Are you not allowed to? Or. Part of the problem is that it's not invented here. It's not the way they have done it. I've been elected oh, okay. the chairman of the commission for this year, and I'm trying to make changes in okay. a time that we can't physically sit down. Sure. Um, I noticed that you all use uh, constant contact, which right. I, the diocese does, yes. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. What I need to do is I would like to do, and I don't know if it can be done because I'm not that familiar with it, to build a database. Uh, every Curcio, or Kirsty Isha, who has gone through the system, I have information on a That's website awesome. or a uh, email address. Can I go through and build a um, constant comment uh, site to that and then send out the information as I go? Yeah, Constant Contact is an email marketing program. So it's a little bit different than the programs we're talking about here for social media. And there are certain rules about sending a blanket email to people. If you already have their name and contact information, you can send an email to them once. Any of the email marketing platforms will provide a way for them to unsubscribe and in order to stay legal, you have to allow them to unsubscribe. I, I understand and, it. Yeah, and you have a powerful tool right there that you have a database for them, um, for all of these people. So some people think MailChimp is easier to use and Benchmark is another one. You can always Google the top, just in the search bar, what are the top 10 email marketing tools 
and compare them. They'll create a chart for you. What's important? Do you want um, tech support that's free to be available to you? Do you want the price to be better? Do you want to be able to have more subscribers or send out more emails per month? They, they'll create a chart and compare it and you can choose which one you think is best. I, I know that both the Southwest Diocese and the Southeastern Diocese use constant comment or contact to in fact maintain the communications with their the Kirsty Easters. Um, I've got to come up with something because the message is not getting out. I also mm -hmm. I also need to make individual contact with individual priests in individual churches and ask mm -hmm. for ask for support about recruitment, uh, which is another whole shall we say whole ball of wax. Um, well, we do, um, all of the platforms, you know, the top five that you would choose from already have templates and you just input the information. And my recommendation would be to keep it simple and yes, consistent and, you know, just like what Karen talked about as far as branding, as you can tell on the bottom of every single screen, it looks the same and it has our logo for this theme for this year. It has the same gold and black that she uses in Instagram. Just keep it simple and follow the same format on every touch point that you have with your audience and it saves you time. It creates a professional connected look and it raises the professionalism of what you're putting out there. Thank you. And again, I will go back to MailChimp. Um, I have heard a lot of people say it's more user friendly than um, constant contact. I, I use it inter internally within the church and the Christian is here. That's what I use. If you're already familiar with that, my recommendation would be to stick with the program that you're already familiar with. Okay. The other comment or question I asked is, everyone is afraid. We take a lot of pictures at uh, weekends. Now, I everybody says, oh, you can't publish, you can't publish. Do I, um, uh, do I need to get or put something in the application that says that um, you authorize your likeness to be used on as an advertisement for this, or can I do that legally? Or do I need to talk to the lawyer? We have a policy, um, the diocese just created a policy just because those kind of questions came up more because of live streaming. Um, there are certain legal aspects to being in a public setting where um, people are allowed to be photographed in a public setting without permission. Um, if you get into the situation where your registration says to all of the attendees, we are going to be photographing this. This will be used to promote future Curcio events. It could appear on social media, online, in CFE, on the diocesan website and our own website. Um, and just give a blanket statement. This is the way it is. If you're here, this is going to happen. Um, you can do that if you get into a situation where you have a form where everybody has to fill it out, where they give permission or they don't, it becomes an administrative, very complex administrative situation to manage. You have to keep all of that on file. You have to make sure you're only posting pictures of people that gave you their permission or not. Um, you know, when people are being prayed for, that's a sensitive situation. At the revival, we had 4,000 people in attendance. And we took pic pictures of people being prayed for, but we were sensitive to which ones we posted. Um, and sometimes people are willing to be in the paper because it's limited to 11,000 subscribers. And they don't want to be on social media because that could be in front of the whole world. But again, 
the feedback we've been given from other dioceses before we created this policy was with children, you absolutely have to get permission. When it's yeah. adults, you're creating an administrative nightmare for yourself to keep track of all of that. So the recommendation is more to tell people if you're out in public in this setting at this event, we are taking pictures to promote future events. Everyone who attends Crisio or works at Crisio has to fill out an application. It is a strictly voluntary thing. Uh, I've been pushing to add something to that about photograph. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, I probably will go to either my church lawyer or to my private lawyer and get some a mm -hmm. written thing from him. And it's I can not, send you what the diocese created because our chancellor vetted that and sent it to I appreciate that lawyers we'll that. That's, but yeah, that specialize in that area. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go away now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're glad you're here. Thank you for your great questions. It could have been helpful to other people as well. Uh, it's a learning experience. That's right. We have um, another question. Facebook analytics, mm -hmm. which are the metrics to pay attention to and which aren't? Are the number of views of a video more important than engagement? Great question. Facebook analytics is going to tell you everything. Um, and so it's easy to get overwhelmed. Um, here are the numbers that I'm always am looking at. Looking at who, I'm looking at the engagement. So which posts are performing well? Are they getting shared? Um, I feel like the share is a big measure because a share means this individual is willing to take like ownership of this content and put that on their feed. And so they're willing to let other people see where it's easy to like, you know, it's very, it's bolder to share. So I always look at what's getting reshared and kind of by whom. So that's always a measure that I, you know, I care about. It's, I'm not looking for a number that I'm trying to reach, but I'm looking at that to say like, okay, is what I'm putting out resonating? Where do I need to tweak? Um, so that's a number. Uh, I'm always interested in when people unfollow because then it'll tell me like what post they unfollowed on. And so if they're unfollowing on something that's like, well, you know what, that's a core value. Like we're not changing. That's okay. It means they're not the target audience. But if they're unfollowing on something that was like, well, you know, I was kind of not so sure about that post anyways, like it kind of clues you in like maybe, or maybe I'm posting too often. Like you kind of have to, evaluate the whole and look at like how much was I doing maybe that was too much and it caused people to to pull away so I I look at that um I look you know monthly I'll kind of pull a report but I pretty much look at it daily slash weekly um I'm looking at the analytics simply just because they're on your phone and easy to see. Monthly is when I'm doing a deeper dive. So if that gives you like a cadence for you to look at. Um, I also want to say don't get too caught up in the numbers. It's very easy to get caught up in the numbers of how many followers, how many likes, how many all of that. And so the, the diocesan Instagram started um, last year. And we did it like, I think October or so of not last year, year before. 2018. Last. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was pretty much because we knew that the convention was coming and we wanted to really promote, you know, the convention and to get people there. And so we were wanting to fire on all channels, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So it started in late 2018 with this culminating with this kind of giant event. Well, it took until 
December 31st of 2019. So over 12 months to get to 500 Instagram followers. So just so you know, you look at people and they're like, oh, they've got, you know, thousands upon thousands of followers. Um, it's, it's okay if you don't, and it, this stuff takes time. And a lot of the people and groups that do have a much bigger pool. They're playing in a different, <laughs> they're playing in a different pool than we are. So, um, I just don't want you to get caught up in the numbers and comparing yourself. You really want to make sure that the audience that you do have, that you're engaging with the audience that you do have and that that is growing um, at a rate that's, you know, reasonable. Um, Thank you, Karen. Hey, I want to jump in here because um, it's 1.15 and I want to respect Karen's time. She has another commitment. Um, at 1.30 and you guys will all get a follow-up email and we will include some of these slides for you that had a list of um, resources on them or um, the bucket list and then you'll get a link to this video which will be on the diocesan YouTube channel and uh, we'll provide her spreadsheet calendar and if you have any questions that you would like answered, send them to wleach at cfdiocese.org and I'll compile them for Karen. Also, Karen is available to any of your churches to work with you guys individually. So we'll make sure that you have her contact information if any of your churches have it in your budget, you know, she can consult for an hour. She can do more than that. Um, we will include her contact information so that y'all can reach out to her individually if you'd like to for your church. Thank you guys so much for taking out your lunch time to be with us. I hope that everybody learned something. Shoot me an email about what you learned, how this helped what kind of training you could benefit from in the future. And we will continue to provide this kind of training for you. Thank you. And TTFN. Oh, <laughs> TTFN to you too. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Have a great Bye -bye. day. Bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. -bye.